Shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. In this Civ overview, we're going to be revisiting and taking an updated look at the Khmer. Khmer are a very outside-the-box siege and elephant civilization, performing about average on both open and closed maps according to the stats, though this Civ is anything but typical. Given their bonuses are so unique, it's maybe not surprising to learn they tend to perform significantly better in the hands of higher rated players, which I think comes down to two factors. If you've previously felt like you're maybe not getting the most out of them, hopefully this overview will leave you with a bit clearer game plan and a better feeling of how to fully utilize their bonuses. Let's check them out. Starting with their team bonus, their whole team scorpions have plus one range, meaning they go from seven to eight in castle age and up to nine in the late game with siege engineers. In castle age, this is a big deal, going from equal to now outranging crossbows, elite skirmishers, and mangonels who all have seven range, and in imperial have one more range than onagers without siege engineers. Scorpions are undeniably less popular than mangonels and rams, despite being quite a bit cheaper, but can be quite strong against archers or infantry in the mid game, especially to defend against crossbow raids. More commonly though, it's in the late game you see large numbers of scorpions, as a counter to halberdiers or even high pierce armor targets in choke points. Being a team bonus, the effect is quite nice for a Roman or Celt ally for example as well, who might be making some scorpions in a support role for their infantry. Moving on to their Civ bonuses, the first is Khmer remove any building requirements to advance to the next age or unlock other buildings, which includes everything from the barracks to unlock the stable and archery range down to lesser knowns like the blacksmith to unlock the siege workshop and the mill to unlock the market. This is quite a good bonus, and right away in the Dark Age you can save the wood from a barracks and go straight into an archery range or stable, bring up the equivalent cost of three farms right there. Though against enemy scouts, skipping the barracks can sometimes backfire, so you want to wall in expose villagers or have a house nearby if you suspect enemy scouts are about. Maybe even more impactful is how much this can improve a fast castle on a closed map, skipping the usual blacksmith and market on the way up, saving you over 300 wood, and letting you get away with some incredibly fast 22 or 23 villager fast castle builds. The idea is you click up straight after hitting feudal, reaching castle age at potentially around 13 minutes and have knights on the field not too long after. Alternately, going up a bit later with 24 or 25 villagers in Dark Age can also be effective and lead into spamming knights or booming as the situation calls for. At the same time, many players, especially at lower levels, will often forget this bonus entirely and make those prerequisite buildings out of habit, unfortunately missing out on the full potential of what Khmer can do. Even going to Imperial Age though, you avoid the awkward moment where you realize you need to build another prerequisite building, as sometimes happens. Altogether, I would point to this bonus as one of the two main reasons that Khmer perform better at higher elo, as it has the potential to open up alternate build orders and save a lot of resources, whether you're rushing or booming, but you have to remember it and also break your usual habits. Their next Civ bonus is really your main eco bonus, and it's that farmers don't require mills or town centers, giving you a constant trickle of food. In early feudal, this is essentially giving you wheelbarrow for free, with about a 15% collection rate boost compared to a generic civilization. Maybe unexpectedly then, despite your farmers having no carry capacity, wheelbarrow then boosts Khmer farmers by about another 9%. Even Handcart gives an additional 5% boost, with the point being that Khmer farmers are always going to be ahead of other generic civilizations. Keep in mind you also save on the cost of mills, as well as save time and attention when placing farms, while also being able to just pull a villager off any resource and plop down a farm in place, or even better, surround your castles while not having to worry about perfect placement. Of course, there's also a benefit to receiving your food income in real time, and even if you only collect it at the generic rate, you'd still be spending your food a bit earlier than is usually possible. All this ties in especially well with Khmer as a cavalry civilization, making scouts, knights, elephants, or even hazar, all of which are food intensive units and greatly benefit from your above average collection rate and always perfect efficiency. 
Speaking of cavalry though, their next hit bonus is their battle elephants move 10% faster, meaning after husbandry they're even faster than archers. Altogether, Khmer have probably the most well-rounded battle elephants, and they're a nice population efficient choice in the late game on closed maps like Amazon Tunnel or Michi. Though on open maps, generally the mobility of the knight is preferred, with the battle elephant being a secondary option that's slower but better against buildings. And finally, their last bonus is you can garrison up to 5 villagers in each house. This can save the odd villager during raids, though it can also be a tricky bonus to remember in the heat of the moment. There's certainly no harm in having a house near an exposed woodline, berries, or gold just in case, and it also lets them jump through walls without a gate, or even skip between locations in relative safety, as villagers don't seem to be possessive about which house is theirs. It's obviously not ideal to idle your villagers in a house during a raid, but it is better than losing them, and it turns out they even work with a town bell, which I think is pretty clever. So that's the Khmer's bonuses. Between skipping buildings, farms you can place anywhere, garrisoning in houses, plus bonuses for two fairly uncommon units, they're clearly a very unique civilization. That said, forgetting to skip building prerequisites, or alternately trying for incredibly fast uptimes that stifle your economy can hold them back at lower levels, and there's a balancing act there between skipping unnecessary buildings versus hitting castle age and actually being able to do something with it. I think a second issue for Khmer is their specialties can be a trap in the mid game. Trying to go for battle elephants, scorpions, or your unique unit before your economy can handle it can lead to underwhelming results, and just a slow and small army. Remember, you have a top tier farming economy to power conventional strategies, like scouts into knights or crossbows, and there's no rule you have to use elephants or scorpions just for the sake of it. Now let's move on though and take a look at their castle, starting with their unique unit, the Ballista Elephant. There's a lot going on here, and I recently did a deep dive of this unit specifically, but put simply, they're a combination of a battle elephant and a scorpion, immediately suggesting this is more of a late game unit. They have a very high ceiling when massed, but are expensive and difficult to get going, especially in open maps, and can also be vulnerable to a halberdier and onager combo. Compared to elephant archers, or even crossbows and arbalesters, they're fairly hard hitting, with the unique trait of having pass through damage, assuming the target isn't directly adjacent to them, in which case their shots tend to just drop straight down. Those pass through attacks give them a bit of a scorpion quality, though they don't have the range or high attack of the scorpion, meaning they're best suited against light infantry or archers, and less so heavy cavalry, eagles, gulam, huskarls, etc. Basically, anything with high pierce armor is going to give them some trouble. A few hidden things about the unit are first it deals bonus damage against buildings, punching through walls and gates especially a bit faster than you'd expect, while they themselves take lots of bonus damage from anything anti-cavalry, elephant or anti-siege. With that said, once you reach a critical mass it can be quite difficult for melee units to get close enough to use those bonuses, so a few are more counters on paper or in low numbers, whereas in practice it's not so clear cut, especially against halberdiers. Speaking of clear cut, they of course are also a bit unusual for being able to carve a path through trees, giving another reason they're well suited for closed forested maps. As you might expect, they're upgraded like a mix of cavalry and siege, though note they aren't considered to be archers in any way, with players picking up archer armor for them being a common mistake. A couple of situations they thrive in are against skirmishers or archers as a damage sponge, and a large group can be good against halberdiers or even light cavalry, especially if you can get a lot of that pass through damage and fully upgrade them, which is naturally relatively expensive. On the flip side, they don't have the range of the scorpion, so are quite vulnerable to siege, especially onagers and rams, which deal a lot of bonus damage to them and also have good pierce armor. One very natural pairing then is Hazars, as Ballista Elephants can deal with clumps of halberdiers, while Hazar can deal with any siege. Generally, they aren't combined with Battle Elephants or Scorpions, as that ends up being a lot of very expensive upgrades, so supporting a Ballista Elephant mass with trash units is much more common. Also at the castle are of course your unique techs, which both again help your late game army. The first is your castle age unique tech, Tusk Swords. We already saw that Khmer Battle Elephants are extra fast, but with this tech they also have the most attack, and actually beat all other Battle Elephants with equal numbers in Imperial Age. Of course it adds to how expensive they are to tech into, but 21 attack in Imperial is no joke, and this also increases the amount of trample damage Battle Elephants do to adjacent units, as that's calculated as a quarter of their attack. 
Their other unique tech, this time in Imperial, is Double Crossbow. This gives a weaker second projectile for Ballista Elephants and Scorpions. For Ballista Elephants, it's actually not that impressive, having just 6 attack or 7 effort chemistry. Usually, that ends up doing just 1 or 2 damage after enemy armor comes into play, but is still worth picking up if Ballista Elephants are your death ball unit of choice. The effect for Scorpions, on the other hand, is to give them a 12 attack secondary bolt, so they're helped out a bit more. Usually, you'd only make one of Scorpions or Ballista Elephants in the very late game, but this tech makes sure you're benefiting either way. I should note that getting both unique techs is a little unusual, as the most natural feeling late game compositions tend to feature just one of those units affected, unless you're just drowning in resources. So that's their castle, which really beefs up your late game ceiling for a few powerful gold intensive units. If anything, the castle emphasizes what you're more likely to use on a closed map, like Black Forest or Arena, rather than an open map like Arabia, where I think it's much easier to play using more conventional units. To explore how flexible they are though, let's take a look now at their tech tree, starting with the archers. The fact you can jump straight into your archery range in Feudal without a barracks means archers are a very smooth opening, or a good follow-up to scouts if your opponent goes heavily into spears, and their arblasters are nearly fully upgraded, just missing thumbring, making for a very natural complement with hussars. The cavalry archer is also viable, especially with the heavy cavalry archer upgrade now increasing their accuracy to 80% without thumbring, and you even get hand cannoneer. Overall, even without a direct bonus here and lacking thumbring, I'd still give the archery range a B plus for some really underrated flexibility. Next up for infantry, they're missing quite a few things here, including some armor and have a very weak militia line. The spear line does work still as a counter unit or a throwaway meat shield, and that's usually about it. I'd say it's a C for their infantry, and considering you can skip the barracks to go for an archery range or stable directly, it's not uncommon to see Khmer not even make a barracks at all. Moving on to their cavalry, this is really their strength. They have a great scout opening, again skipping the barracks, and the tech tree is open all the way up to fully upgraded Hazar and Cavalier. The battle elephant can also be a solid choice in team games when you need some population efficiency and a damage sponge in front of ranged units. I personally consider Khmer a borderline top 10 cavalry civilization based on their good farming alone, and scouts into two stable knights is probably their safest default game plan. I'll give them an A- for Cavalry, just held back by not having Paladin or a direct Cavalry bonus, but in Castle Age, they can keep up with pretty much anyone stable. Next up for Siege, they have a really solid tech tree, and their Scorpions have plus one range of course, making them among the most viable in the game. Not needing a Blacksmith to create a Siege Workshop also opens some interesting Arena Siege push potential. In this particular case, just given how dangerous onagers are to elephants or scorpions, it's really too bad you don't have Bombard Cannon, but that was removed a few years ago specifically to make onagers a greater threat. Overall though, I still think it's enough for a B+. Moving on to the navy, a lot of your bonuses don't really land on water maps, or even hybrid maps all that well. As you might expect then, a lot of their worst matchups online are actually on maps that include water. Late game, you have a decent number of options, so they're certainly passable, but just go to a very generic start, and hybrid or especially full water maps can be quite snowbally if you fall behind early. I'd say they're a C plus civilization on water early, ending up with a B in the late game for a B minus overall. Taking a quick look at the monks, unfortunately they're missing block printing to help against onagers, though the other important monk techs are here. A monk play is pretty reasonable as Khmer, but keep in mind they're one of the only good monk civs that lack atonement, meaning someone else with that tech could convert your monks without a way for you to get them back. They're okay, but not great, and in this case it's enough for a B. Next up for defenses, it's a pretty good university overall. Adding to their defensive playstyle as well is the house bonus, which can save you from early raids, and even scorpions with extra range can be nice to hold against mid-game crossbow pressure. The ability to place farms anywhere can also make you harder to raid, and to me they feel like a B plus for defenses. Ending now with their trash units, that is units that don't cost gold, on paper they don't have any direct bonuses here, but having arguably the best late game farmers means their Hazar spam is top tier anyway. Elite skirmishers have the basics, and the halberdier can still function as anti-cavalry well enough, and altogether I'd say it's a B plus for trash, with an A level Hazar spam. So to give some final thoughts, there's no question Khmer are a little tricky to pick up, but have a lot of potential for a creative player. As I said, the safest default option I think is scouts into knights, skipping the barracks entirely to get a cleaner start. 
Archers and a crossbow is also completely viable though, and even if it's just to add in skirmishers with knights, a relatively early archery range can often be useful. In contrast, I'd argue their elephant and scorpion specialties can be a trap in the mid-game if you overinvest in them beyond maybe a couple of defensive scorpions or as a pairing with an army of mostly knights. In terms of late-game compositions, Hazar paired with Arblester or Scorpion is always a classic as they protect each other's weaknesses, though Khmer have several good combinations depending on what you're up against. In Black Forest or Amazon Tunnel especially is when their population-efficient units like Battle or Ballista Elephants can shine, and a critical mass of them mixed with Hazars can be almost impossible to stop. Easily my favorite part of Khmer though is the very satisfying moment of clicking straight up from Feudal to Castle Age without building a Blacksmith and Market. In fact, I've been saving so much of my own time not queuing up feudal buildings with Khmer that I've been able to put that time into pursuing my dream of opening an Age of Empires resort, Spirit of the Lake. It even has a great website thanks to this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Where websites traditionally take a lot of technical knowledge to set up and maintain, Squarespace is a tool to help you create a professional looking site within minutes. If you're a blogger, own a small business, or chasing the passive income dream of opening an online store, but have no idea how to make a functional website from scratch, Squarespace has you covered with templates and tools to help you out, simplifying the website building process. Squarespace even has great third-party extensions to handle things like inventory, taxes, shipping, and scheduling to accommodate your specific needs. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash spirit of the law to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So hopefully this video gave you a few new ideas to try with a very fun but quirky civilization. Squarespace have generously sponsored several upcoming videos, which is a great opportunity for me to go back and revisit some of these more outdated overviews over the next few months, which I'm looking forward to. That'll do it for this one though. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you next time.